Finally, I'm live. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Hope you've had a fantastic weekend and that you're ready to switch on your brain. I'm very excited to have you all back with me again. And I just get so thrilled at the response that we get to this book. It's just amazing. My first, uh, well, I've written 17 books, but this was the first, uh, the fourth book I published in this country, but it has just flown we have we have got so many th hundreds of thousands of people around the world reading this book switch on your brain so i'm really so excited to do this bible study with you or oh, bible study sorry book review with you book study with you to help you to really get into this there's so much content in here and as you know by now all my content is linked so honestly, when you've finished doing this series with me, go back and study The Perfect You and Think, think Learn, Succeed and Think and Eat Yourself Smart. Do all of them because everything is linked into each other. There's just too much information to put it all in one book, and that's why it's all over the different books. Now, remember, with this book, Switch on Your Brain, there's also this amazing workbook that will help you work through if you're doing group studies. This is so fantastic. Even if you're on your own, it just helps you to break down all this information. There's a DVD that goes with that. So you've got your workbook and DVD. So if you're in a group, this is a great way. Or on your own, if you put the DVD in, you've got the workbook. The workbook and DVD match each other exactly, and you'll find all the answers in this book so the three work together great great set you can get those as a pack i mean this is an amazing gift for someone amazing gift for yourself so it comes together all three of those in a pack and then of course my devotional which i my first devotional which has done so well we just released it at the end of last year thousands of copies sold we're so thrilled about it and excited and this is really a an amazing um, way of getting all these concepts that i teach into your head in a daily simple sound bites and of course don't forget to follow me on social media because i also give you lots of mental health tips and information to help you process all this information you can't hear this stuff enough because it's all about how we are managing our day-to-day -day stress our day-to-day -day mind how we deal with life how we take advantage of these incredible minds to use our incredible brains so that's so now what we're going to do is we're going to dive into chapters one through four. And then at the end of today, I'm going to just quickly touch on the last six tips in the end of this chapter, the last chapter of this book. I only did the first six tips last week. We'll end off with that. Um, and then I'm also going to tell you right now, I can't hold it in because I'm so excited. But our Switch app is finally live. We released it on Friday, where well, we had a soft, what we call a soft launch on Friday, but I've been telling you about this every week, and we we um, had a lot of problems over the weekend with Google, which I'm sure you're aware there was a global issue with Google, So, but that's all fixed apparently today. It's intermittent, but it seems to be fixed, and Apple, there was a few issues with Apple, but we should have everything live by Wednesday, so get your hands on Switch. Over these, if you don't get it over the next couple of days, get it over the next few weeks while you are doing the study because the second half of the book deals with the 21-day brain detox, which I have unpacked in the most phenomenal way into Switch and I've incorporated elements from the perfect you, think, learn, succeed. And the Switch app has got this, the basic five steps and it's going to have lots and lots of add-ons. So all the different things that I teach that there's so much to learn, I'm putting into app form so that you can incorporate them in your daily life. So when you're getting ready in the morning, when you're doing your exercise, when you're cooking your great food, healthy, think and eat yourself smart food, you can then work through these apps on a continual basis. We're going to have add-ons for children, for teenagers, for panic attacks, for anxiety, really taking the practical side of how do I deal with life. So taking these principles and putting them into a day-to-day -day life. So guys, get the book. Get the book for your friends. Make sure you read the chapters in advance. And if you don't, haven't had time, that's okay. You can read them off and we want to go back and watch these as many times as you want. What we're seeing a lot of people do around the world with book studies I've been doing is they're getting the books and the workbooks and the DVDs, the online program, and they and the app and they are we're watching the what doing working through the dvd in the workbook and then also watching the videos these youtube live re-watching the videos so it helps you to then get a little deeper into the concepts concepts okay so are you ready switch on your brain first four chapters this book is really a great way of getting a grip on understanding how to renew your mind understanding the principles of mental health. Mental ill health is not a disease. 
mental ill health is when we haven't got our mind renewed or we're not constantly renewing our mind. And also mental challenges come from when we've gone through adverse circumstances. And life is filled with those challenges, extreme, little big ones, it's the human condition. So we need to learn to cope with that. And we need to know about the power in our mind to cope with life and to release that potential in us and to live in the loving human way that God has designed us to live and model our lives after that loving model that we see in Jesus. So in this book, I really try and introduce you to the principles of the power of your mind, really understanding the power of your mind. And one of the first principles that I teach in this book is that you are not your brain. You are not your brain. Your mind is not your brain. Your mind is one thing and your brain is another thing. Your brain is the physical. Your brain and your body are the physical. This physical brain and body are very complicated. Your brain is super complicated. We only understand about maybe 2 to 8%, maybe 10% of how the brain functions. We're learning new stuff every day about how the brain functions. But essentially, the brain is reliant on the mind for its operation. So the brain doesn't switch you on. The brain doesn't isn't pre-programmed to make you say what you're saying. It isn't, you're not a robot. Your brain is the very complex organ through which your very complex mind moves. So your brain responds to your mind. Your brain and your body collectively are made of 75 to 100 trillion cells. So your brain and your body, which are made of 75 to 100 trillion cells, 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 physical cells, little cells made of nucleus and mitochondria and cell walls, all the biological stuff, cell biology, those cells are controlled by your mind. What is your mind? Your mind is the other 99%. So the 99% is your mind. Your mind is your ability to think and feel and choose. When you think, you feel. When you think and feel, you choose. When you think and feel and choose, you generate mind in action, which generates quantum energy, which goes through your brain. And when it goes moves through your brain, your brain responds on a quantum level with clouds of energy, on an electromagnetic level, and on a chemical level. So your brain responds to the stimulation from your mind. This is powerful because it means you are not a victim of your biology. You are a victor over and above your biology. This means that your environment, your circumstances, the socioeconomic situation around you, the people you're in contact with, your job, your life, things that have happened as a child, adverse child experiences, ACEs, all these things create the environment within which you are responding to, which is your thinking, feeling, choosing, and you're pushing that through your brain, and you are building that into your brain. So you build thoughts into your brain, and thoughts are real things that occupy mental real estate. So that is kind of a summary of the first chapter. So if I just flip over to the, the um, I just want to start with the introduction. Actually, I want to read you just from the prologue. There's a statement that I make that's very powerful, that actually is really good for you to think about. What would you do if you found a switch that you could that could turn on your brain and able and enable you to be happier, healthier in your mind and body, and more prosperous and intelligent? Well, in this book, you will learn how to find and activate that switch. So, what would, what I'm asking you is. What would you think if you had a switch to switch your brain on? Well, the switch is your mind. You have that switch in your hand. We have to understand our minds because our minds are what activates our brains and our body. Therefore, if we can control our minds, we have a lot of influence about how we are going to cope in life and how our physical responses are going to function. We're doing research at the moment, and I'll tell you about this every week. We're doing clinical trials, and these clinical trials are amazing because we are looking at when you – when you apply the techniques that I teach in this book and all my principles, in we actually using the the principles all put into the app. We're testing the app in my clinic. I mean, using the app in my clinical trial. But when when you direct your mind intentionally and deliberately, you're going to improve your how your brain responds, how your brain functions, how your DNA functions, how your blood functions, how you are feeling about the story of your life, coping with the circumstances. You see, your what you are going through is not meant to be suppressed. 
it's meant to be honored that you've been through stuff. You don't want to stay there in the pain, but you want to reconceptualize that so that you can celebrate the changes inside of you. And that's everything. That's what I'm trying to help you to do, to build your resilience so that you can cope with the demands and the stresses of life. Okay, so that's what we're doing, that big picture of in this book. So you have an extraordinary ability, I say on page 13, to determine, achieve, and maintain optimal levels of intelligence, mental health, peace, and happiness, as well as the prevention or and the control of disease in your mind and your body. Now, I want to just stress here that you mustn't pursue happiness or peace like something external that you've got to bring inside of you. It's inside of you. And you've also got to redefine happiness you need a new narrative because it doesn't mean that, that, that the complete absence of pain pain is part of life it's part of suffering and pain are part of life it's learning how to manage them and have the peace within the circumstances have the little freaking out in the love zone as i always say and then being able to have that surety inside of you that you've got the resilience that you're going to calm down that you're going to get through this moment get off some steam and then you're going to get through it you've got this in you you are brilliant the more you develop your mind, the more you grow your intelligence. The post that I put up today was talking about how you've got to grow your brain with your mind. And when you, the, the more you think deeply about content, the knowledge and information, the more intelligent you're becoming, which also improves your mental health. So there's so many excellent tips that you're going to learn from following me on social media, getting these books. They really are designed to help you become an amazingly beautiful person that connects in a deep, meaningful way with other people. Because remember, it's not just about you. It's about you in the world. Okay, so now I'm going to jump over to chapter, to chapter one, to the introduction. And what I do in this book, which is really, people love this, is the structure of this book is such that I give you the main scripture in the chapter. So switch on your brain with introduction, switch on your brain with hope, and then I give you the main scripture. I give you a linked science concept, and then I proceed to explain it with um, science and, and graphics and pictures and then I give a summary at the end of the chapter of the main points of the book so it's super easy to get your information you know to really get the stuff get to grips with the stuff and this is something you can read for the rest of your life you're going to keep on learning it's kind of reminders every day and that's why it's so nice to have the dvd in the workbook and the the, uh, the journal i mean the sorry the devotional which we call readings 365 readings for peak happiness thinking and health it's just so great because it's all prompting and reminding you to get your mind under control if your mind's not under control nothing else is going to be under control it starts with this and this this is just a way it's a lifestyle i'm trying to teach you a lifestyle Okay, so it was just the main scripture in, in the introduction is faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Now, there's so much we can unpack in that scripture in terms of science. It's so scientific. Remember, science and spirituality are the same thing. There is no distinction. When we talk science, we're talking knowledge. Knowledge comes from God. God is absoluteness. Okay, so the linked science concept to that scripture, or one of them is millions, but the one in this particular chapter is that thoughts are real Things, physical things that occupy mental real estate. Thoughts are substance and evidence. Moment by moment of every day, you are changing the structure of your brain. You are changing the structure of your brain by the way that you are thinking, feeling, and choosing. When you hope, when you have hope, it is an activity of your mind, and it's a choice that changes the structure of the brain in a positive and normal direction. So hope empowers the resilience of the brain to lift so that you can function at a higher level. That is really amazing, okay? So just a few decades ago now, back in the 80s when I was doing my initial degrees and in research, I was told and trained that the brain then resulted in them not being able to function or they had a traumatic brain injury or they had some learning problem. They were told, we were told and trained that the brain could not change. So I was trained to teach my patients to compensate, which meant, okay, that's it, that function is gone. Let's now find some kind of other way around it. And I didn't believe that that was a good way of functioning. I really believed in giving hope to my patients. And that is why I went down this line of research, where if you can determine to understand how to think and feel and choose well, you can then improve the structure of your brain and therefore how you think how you feel, how you choose, and therefore your behaviors, your academic functioning, your cognitive functioning, how you're managing stresses and, and academics and relationships and work and day-to-day -day life. And let's face it, we all need that help. 
none of us are exempt. Every day I'm facing multiple challenges in my work life and as a mom of four and, and dealing with all the things I do in, in my work and stuff. It's always, we're constantly dealing with challenges. And I tell you, I use this every day. All these things I teach you are a part of my life. And I use them. So it's coming from experience as well as working with patients and doing research, okay? So basically, you have this most phenomenal ability. I love this sentence. When we hope, it's an activity of the mind that changes the structure of a brain in a positive and normal direction because your brain is designed for hope. It's got substance and evidence. It, the substance and evidence of the brain is one of hope structure. So when you hope, you align with the structure of the brain, which activates the brain to function at a higher level. And what does that mean? You're going to think clearly. You're going to be able to calm down quicker. You're going to be able to see the way through. And when things don't work out, you're going to see possibilities. And you're going to see the mistakes that you've made as lessons to be learned. You're going to see the, the changes or the, 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 the errors or things that, should have, that you should have done not as something to hold you back, but as something to propel you forward. You just see life differently. But it's something we've got to work at every single day. One book study is not going to help you. This is lifestyle stuff I'm teaching. That is why I'm bringing out the app, the Switch app, to help you use all of this stuff and then cement it with the app where you can do this stuff daily. It's going to be so, so amazing. Okay, so um, basically, I was, as I said, I was told that things can't change. And if we slip through the rest of this chapter, I basically explain that that prevailing view is not correct. And then I tell you about the kind of places where I worked. I worked with autistic children. I worked with senior citizens with dementia. I worked with young, young men and women, thousands in South Africa in the pre-apartheid and post-apartheid era. I would spend three days a week working in the most abject poverty, terrible conditions where people were so abused and so poor and so uh, they had gone through so much political challenges from the apartheid government and so on. That's where I really learned my most of my got my most of my experience is seeing that when you help people see the power of their mind, that despite the conditions, they can learn to cope and find a way through, which is so important. I worked extensively with car accident victims, people who had damage from car accidents or motorbike victim motorbike accidents or getting damage to the head from sport and that kind of thing. Um, I worked with people, children with dyslexia, with learning disabilities, with learning problems. I worked with suicidally and emotionally traumatized people. I worked with entire schools and organizations. So I have a lot of experience seeing that when you give hope to people, when you help people to understand how to use the mind correctly, you can change the brain. So we see now that there's a huge move forward. And if I jump to, I'm going to jump to the summary to page 26. I want you to just jump to page 26, 25, sorry. There's a few key points that I want you to really get from this book page 25, and I'm just going to jump through a few of them quickly. Your mind is the most powerful thing in the universe after God. That's an amazing statement. Free will and choice is real. Okay, there's, I just listened to a TED talk yesterday, and I've done a TEDx talk. If you want to listen to my TEDx talk, you'll pick it up on my website or just Google Dr. Leaf on, on TED Talks. Um, and I was listening to a talk yesterday, and this guy was saying, well, free will doesn't exist and everything he's saying at this moment is pre-programmed in his brain. And he said, but I can't actually explain why I'm different to someone else and why you've got different choices to me. And so, you know, in one sentence, he shot down everything that he said science is saying that we are. He said we're basically just biological machines that are pre-programmed to just generate this energy of speaking and living. And it made absolutely no sense. And that was followed up immediately by someone of the opposing point which that you are able to think feel and choose we have free will it's not an illusion you have a um, you have a perception and it develops through life it's organic you as a person are organic you're growing and getting to know yourself more and more the perfect you series the perfect you book really helps you understand that okay so you're basically um, i'm just going to pick a few of these your body is not in control of your mind you're not a result of your genes your genes don't control you you you, by just listening to me now, you are actually manufacturing genes that are enabling you to build these thoughts. You control your genes. Okay? There's certain genes, obviously, that do come through that are dysfunctional, that comes through from generations past, from various... I'm going to talk in later chapters about... I'm so sorry about that. I'm so sorry about that. Okay? 
Um, but we're going to talk about that later. But you're in control. You, genes are not self-emergent. Self-emergent means genes don't switch themselves on, okay? You are designed to stand outside yourself and observe your own thinking, feeling, and choosing. So right now, I'm looking at myself in the camera, which is really, off. it's like really feels weird. But what I'm doing is a very good example of a point I'm just trying to make, is that you can actually stand back and observe your own facial expressions, hand movements, what you're saying, how you're saying it, what are you thinking? And in that way, you can learn to self-regulate and learn to see your reactions and, and learn to control, be very deliberate about how you say things, what you're saying, how you're reacting. And yes, it's hard. And yes, you can't do it all the time. And yes, our brains are designed to do it like literally every 10 seconds. But it's a, it's, it's, it's a lifestyle that we choose to get into, a self-regulated, self-examined lifestyle. Okay, so you are designed, this is a great one, to recognize and choose the right things to think about. This is great stuff. Each morning when you wake up, you have new baby nerve cells that are there waiting for you to build into the networks of your brain as you think, feel, and choose. You build these new baby nerve cells into your brain. You can learn how to deepen your intellect, how to overcome learning issues, how to get the chaos in your mind under control. You don't have to walk around in guilt and condemnation. If you wire those toxic thoughts in, you can wire them out. You don't have to get stuck in bad habits. You can overcome feelings of rejection and hurt. Forgiveness is not the battle that you think it is. I'm reading from page 26 now. I'm just picking on a few things. These are all the benefits of operating in this mode of switching on your brain. These are the things you're going to learn from this book and this and this bio, when you study this book and the, the workbook and, and the DVD. If you've just joined us, we're studying this book, workbook, the DVD, and the daily devotional. These are the kind of things. You, can, you don't have to worry about things that are out of your control. You're not a victim of the things that you shouldn't be doing. You don't have to fear that if conditions run in your family that you're just automatically going to get that. We're going to talk about all these cool things in this book. You can balance overthinking and overanalyzing and you can direct that. You don't have to keep digging into the past to get free, but you can control the past by recognizing the influence of the past and changing how it plays out into your future. These are all the things that you can do. It's so exciting. Get excited about this because this is an amazing, wonderful gift. Then I go into the summary. And in the summary, I summarized like it was only a few decades ago that scientists said that we couldn't control our brain and we can, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the introduction to this book to get you super excited. Now, chapter one, mind controls matter, not matter controls mind. So your mind is your thinking, feeling, choosing. It's the 99% of who you are. It's the non-physical, spiritual part of who you are. Your brain and body are part of the physical, which is the 1%. So mind controls the physical mind non-physical controls matter physical okay not the other way around the brain does feed back into the mind so if you're not feeding your brain and body which we've spoken about in the previous book if you're not activating your perfect view which we spoke about in the at the beginning in january and february if you're not thinking learning and succeeding correctly which we spoke about in, uh, the month in february and march you i mean in march you are not going to be, um, you're not going to be activating your mind to function like it should. So all your all these things combine together to help you to function optimally. Okay. So mind controls matter, not the other way around. You make matter out of mind, and what you make, the matter you make matters because every thought that you build into your brain with your mind, and you build thoughts into your brain as you're thinking, feeling, and choosing, is building the root of what you say and what you do. You think, feel, choose with your mind. You build that into your brain as a physical structure, and that then is the root of what you say and do, which feeds back into your mind. Okay, so it's this feedback loop that you control. Okay, you can't control the events and circumstances of your life, but you, you can control your emotions. Okay? So in chapter my, the main scripture, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. So your default mechanism is of love and power and soundness. So in this chapter, I'm talking about mind controlling matter. And the science concept that's linked to that scripture is that science shows that we are wired for love with a natural optimism bias. Our natural design is thinking well, feeling well, making good choices. That's our design physically. It's our design on a, on a, on a spiritual level, which is the non-physical level. So you designed with this. So what we have to do is learn how to opt, activate and optimize the design. And that's what I'm teaching you to do with all my books and all my techniques. I'm teaching you how to activate and optimize the design. 
Okay, so the mind is what the brain does is one of my headings in page 31. And I talk about on page 32, the brain does the bidding of the mind. I talk about choices are real. So page 33, choices are real. I just want to dive into that just for a little bit. You are free. I'm reading from page 33. You are free to make choices about how you focus your attention. I love it. You are free to make choices about how you focus your attention. And this affects how the chemicals and the proteins and the wiring of your brain change and function. Scientists have shown over and over, and I'm showing that with my research, that the way you think affects your brain, changes your brain, changes your functioning physiologically and on a cognitive, social and emotional level. Okay, so um, I talk about how thinking activates genes. It is your thinking that generates this quantum energy that switches your genes on to make the proteins that you need to be alive. How amazing is that? Our brains are shaped by our reactions. You see, you can't control the events and circumstances of your life, but you can control your reactions to the events and circumstances of your life. Okay, so the way you react is your thinking feeling you're choosing, which then switches on genes, which then build these thoughts into your brain. So you shape your brain by your reactions. And that's why I say we've got to control our reactions. We have to learn to control them. Our thinking changes our DNA. How you think actually changes, our DNA changes shape according to our thinking. Amazing. Stress is, and this I've spoken about extensively, and I talk about it in all my books because it's important. Stress is good for you. Stress stage one is good for you. Stress is where everything is firing up to a high level so that you can focus, concentrate, and make good decisions in your brain is functioning optimally the problem is when you perceive stress as being bad for you which is what we've been told by media and it's incorrect information stress is not bad for you but if you perceive it as bad for you you will make it bad for you so when you perceive stress as bad for you stress works against you instead of for you so when you are in a state of when you are in a challenging situation and you're feeling your heart pounding and adrenaline pumping and you're talking faster and, and you're feeling anxious or you're withdrawn or however you react to stress Immediately grab that and, and with your mind, remember what I'm saying, make a decision in your mind to make that stress work for you. Say, okay, I'm feeling like this. I can work, make this work for me. And as soon as you say that, your body will work for you and not against you. And your blood will flow back from around your heart into from your heart into your brain, more blood, more oxygen, which will help you think clearer. But if you panic and say, oh, no, I feel terrible. My body's reacting. Stress is bad for me. I can't do this you will block mentally and it will become a disastrous situation. So vent, freak out in the love zone, move through, move forward to a solution, okay? So so there's a lot of stuff on page 37 about how reaction is key. You cannot control the events, but you can control your reactions. And that basically stress is something that we can control. Stress can work for us. It's designed to work for us. So I explain that in, in this chapter. And in the, so yeah, essentially in chapter one, what I've covered is that basically there's a debate going on in science between the mind being what the brain does versus the brain doing the bidding of the mind. So that's the debate. The brain is controlling the mind or the mind controls the brain. And we know from science, actually, if you look at it, the mind controls the brain. Mind, thinking, feeling, choosing, 99% spiritual and physical. Brain and body, 1% physical. The mind moves through the brain. The brain responds to the mind. The brain and body respond to the mind. Okay, so uh, that's where basically what I cover here. Then I talk about how our thinking changes our DNA and how stress can work for us. Chapter two, talking about choice and your multiple perspective advantage, which I briefly explained at the beginning, which is like I gave the example of me looking at myself on the screen, which is here, quickie, but that's a really good example of the multiple perspective advantage. Watch yourself on a screen, watch yourself in the mirror and Train yourself to be very aware of your voice, your tone, your speed of speaking, uh, facial expressions, your hand movements, how you're saying things, what you're saying. This ability to stand back and observe your own thinking is an amazing way of helping you to manage your day-to-day -day life and also helping you to manage the trauma you're going through. If you're going through trauma, we all go through levels of trauma and different stages of our life and different extreme versions from minor to, mech, to, terror, to major trauma situations. But every day we're dealing with something. And every day we've got to deal with thoughts that are bad habits and things that we've got, got to deal with. And the multiple perspective advantage is your ability to stand back and observe your own thinking. 
So I'm just going to read the, the main scripture and the link science concept, page 39, chapter 2, choice in your multiple perspective advantage. Main scripture, let the peace of God rule in your heart. I'm just shortening it, okay? Link science concept, choice is real and free will exists. You are able to stand outside of yourself and observe your own thinking, consult with God and change negative, toxic thoughts and grow them into positive, healthy thoughts. I go into tremendous depth about that in the Perfect You book, which we've studied, and also in Think, Learn, Succeed. So in different ways, I see to all these things. So this is really an introductory text to all the, all the texts. Okay, when you do this, your brain responds with a positive neurochemical rush and structural changes that will improve your intellect, health, and peace. So when you choose to observe your own thinking, your brain functions in a better way. You become more intelligent. So the more deliberate and intentional you, you are about self-regulating what you're thinking, feeling, choosing, saying, doing, etc., facial expressions, nonverbal, all this stuff, the more intelligent you become. The more intelligent means more wisdom, means better management of your day-to-day -day situations, the long-term, the short-term, the studying, the relationships, the work, everything, okay? So these are... So many, many of us walk through life, and I make a great statement here on page 39 at the bottom. Many of us walk through life as though we were victims of events and circumstances. And I do not deny that socio-political, socio-economic and political circumstances are pretty much out of our control. And there's people that live in poverty-stricken areas. There's people that are in abusive situations. We never deny that those are real. They exist. And there's no way that you can always control those situations. As I said, I worked in apartheid South Africa where people were living under extreme conditions that were not their fault. And this is a reality in life. The point I'm making is that you can walk through that thinking that you're hopeless or you can be in those situations and start learning how to get some power back in your mind and realizing how to develop the, the mental resilience to cope with these situations so that you can see the way out, the way through, the way forward and the way to continue living. And I can speak from experience because of working in extreme situations for 25 years and working for 30 years in clinical practice and going through also with my own family and things, lots of stuff. So none of us are exempt. We've all got stuff we've gone through. So when I talk, I'm not talking from theoretical positions or a laboratory scientist position. I'm talking from experience, okay? So we've got to be careful that we don't put the blame on other people. We have to acknowledge the situations. We have to acknowledge that we've got to look at society We've got to look at the making changes socioeconomically and politically. We've got to look at abusive situations. We've got to look at adverse child circumstances. We have to deal with those. At the same time, we have to also look at our responsibility and our role. So a child who's been abused has no responsibility there in terms of they were, it wasn't their fault. But once, once we get the child out of that situation, we have to teach that child how to not become a victim of what they've been through and just give up. We have to teach them this is terrible, but this is how you're going to cope and how to teach people how to take responsibility to deal with the past, to reconceptualize and to move forward. Okay, So um, we've got to also be careful we're in a quick fix environment at the, in the society where it's, you know blame everyone for everything. Um, there is a lot of that around. Look for a quick fix. Blame your symptoms, blame your brain for your um, lack of concentration or blame your brain for your depression. Your brain can't be blamed for your depression. You can't blame. You've got to, you've got to look at what you're going through and, and take that responsibility and then find the causes and then try and work around ways of dealing with those causes. Okay, so um, free will. Okay, that's it. A lot about free will. I'm talking again in this chapter. Throughout, I always talk about free will because we get very muddled about free will. We know we can make a choice, but sometimes we act like we can't. So we need to get a, a, an understanding on that. We can choose to think the way God wants us to think. Um, there's a lot of um, activity that happens when you are thinking, feeling, and choosing, which go together. You will see a lot of activity in the frontal lobe. We see our brain responding in a very good way as we think, feel, and choose to control our actions. So uh, I make a point on page 42, the second paragraph, where I say, my argument is that the brain activity that we see when people are thinking, feeling, and choosing is the processing activity that we're doing on our very powerful and unconscious level. And it's very real and active. And this is our memories and our thoughts and all our memories that we've implanted. And we, our own unique perception comes through. So it's not our brain doing the work. And we can't blame our brain. I've got a faulty gene. That's why I'm grumpy. I've got a damaged brain. That's why I can't focus. I've got a 
damaged um, bad genes so that's why I fight with my husband or my, what, whatever we've got to be very careful of saying well I, I taking that responsibility away you are you in a situation good or bad or both and we have to look at what the role we play and we have to look at our reactions and we look at have to have to have clarity of thought so that we know how to reach out and get help from others okay um so choice then I speak a lot in this chapter about the science of choice and how choice is real and it's got mental real estate. And by what that I what that I what I mean by that is that choice has mental real estate around the front of the brain. So we see when people are making a choice, we see because because it's so conscious and deliberate, the front of the brain is very, very active when you are awake and you're very actively thinking, feeling, and choosing. So we see a lot of response in the brain. The whole brain is always responding, but we will see a lot of activity when people are making choices. So um, this standing back and observing our own thoughts, I call this, and I go onto this on page 45, and there's a really cool drawing of just how you, the different parts of your brain and how the five senses um, information comes in through our five senses and it also comes through our entire body in a quantum way and it moves through our brain and we think, feel and choose. As we're thinking, feeling and choosing, we're pushing energy through the brain and the brain is responding and that switches genes on and we build thoughts into the outer part of our brain. So you'll see this drawing coming up in all my books and, and in all my teachings because I use this as a reference point to help you understand these concepts. So we have this multiple perspective advantage. I talk about this on page 45. And um, this, in, this multiple perspective advantage helps us to stand back and observe our own thinking like a different perspective. We have a unique design opportunity, the way we designed to stand back and assess our thoughts and their impact. And, and we can choose to connect to, to love, to the correct thinking. We are directly responsible for what we choose to think about and dwell on. Um, and we make these decisions in the privacy of our own thinking. Okay, that's a really powerful statement. So we are, we are directly responsible for what we choose to think about and dwell on. Whatever you think about and dwell on is growing in your brain. And we make these decisions in the privacy of our own thinking. So we need to make sure our thinking is under control. As you think, it's very important to make a distinction between who you truly are, the real multifaceted perfect you that we spoke about in the Perfect You book, and um, the person you've become through toxic choices. So who you've become through toxic choices, through toxic experiences, that's not who you are. If you, you've wired it in, you can wire it out. Your brain follows the instructions and choices of your mind, okay? You are a thinking being. I talk about on page 46. As you think and feel and choose, you create change. You're a power, you have a love power and a sound mind. The power of your mind is that is your is the fact that you can think, feel, and choose. When you think, you feel. When you think and feel, you choose. The three go together, and this generates this very powerful quantum energy to your brain that creates structural change in your brain. And those are thoughts that you build. And then I go on to explain the signals of your thoughts, and and I get into a bit of technical detail there. But this the the signal literally unzips the brain. So you, with your thinking, you're generating this energy, and it unzips the brain, and unzips the DNA. And then they start doing stuff. And that's what I talk about on page 40, 48, the signal. What's the signal? The signal is your thinking, feeling, and choosing generates quantum energy through your brain, which then causes this electrical and magnetic energy and chemical response, which then unzips the DNA. And then the DNA express, the genes express and build things. What things? Your thoughts, what you're thinking about, what you're reading, what you're learning, what you're observing, become physical thoughts, and those become the roots of your words and your actions. I know this is complicated, but if you understand that you control this process and that if you've made a mess and you've built a toxic thought, you can, you can through your mind, change that. Okay, I don't want to think like that anymore. Just being aware of that thought weakens it, and you can start changing it, which is what we're going to learn as we study this book. So basically, we can switch on our brain as we are thinking and I go into um, I go into more about genes there and I talk about the gene myth and the, the gene myth is what we've been on from the gene myth to the future to the to the truth is we've been living under the myth called the gene myth. Now what is that? It basically locates the power of our health and mental well-being in the untouchable realm of genes. So it's like genes are everything. They they are your everything. They control everything. That's what it says. Um, that's what the gene myth is, but it's not the truth because the genes can't switch yourself on. So the myth is the genes 
you are pre -pro of, uh, contain the pre-programmed parts of you and free will is an illusion. And that is the gene myth and that you're just biological beings. But the truth is that your genes have to be activated. They have to be switched on and they switch on by your incredibly powerful mind, which was the scripture at the beginning of this chapter. So I speak about our choices act as our choices, our thinking, feeling, and choosing, which is which produces our choices, our reactions, act as the signals that unzip the DNA, which I spoke about earlier in this chapter. Genes may, ha may have been made out to be responsible for feelings of spirituality and belief, even like, sorry, let me say that again. Genes have been made out as though they're responsible for everything. Your gene for alcoholism, gene for happiness, gene for um, gene for this, gene for that, gene for enjoyment. This person on this TED talk yesterday was saying this, that we've got genes for happiness. Some of us don't have enough genes for happiness. That's why people are, some people aren't happy. That's not even science. That's not even evidence-based science. You know, science can be twisted and interpreted in so many ways. We have to have discernment. We have to see what are they, did they test in this research that they make, that they come to these conclusions and really listen carefully to what they're saying. So I've tried to help you with this. There's lots of references in this book. I'm trying to make hard science easily accessible. So in summary, you're not a victim. In this chapter, free will is not an illusion. Free will influences our thinking, which produces our state of mind. And what we say and do is already built into our minds. Okay, and there's a lot more there. Chapter three, your choices change your brain. And I've said this a hundred times already. Your choices change your brain. Your choices are the result of your thinking, feeling, and choosing. Main scripture is the renewing of the mind. Link science concepts. Through our thoughts, we can be our own microsurgeons or our own neurosurgeons as you make choices that will change the circuitry in our brains. It will actually build circuits, rewire circuits. We are designed to do our own brain surgery and rewire our brains and our thinking, excuse me, <clears throat> and by choosing to renew our minds. Renewing your mind, renewing your brain. Amazing. Renewing your body, renewing your life. This is real physical work. This is not some ethereal weird thing. This is control that we have that is powerful. Our choices, the natural consequences of our thoughts and imagination. Our choices are the natural thoughts. When you think and feel, you choose. When you choose, you change structure. And that's what this is talking about. Okay, so I talk in this chapter about this absolutely fantastic science called epigenetics, which shows us the power of our reactions, the power of nature, nurture, and the eye factor. Okay, so nature is what you're born with physically, your genes, etc. And also in your DNA, you have um, that you have factors that have come through from the previous generations. That whatever's come through from previous generations through the sperm and the ova is asleep and it's dormant until woken up. How do we wake up toxic patterns from the past, from our generations past? We wake that up by thinking that we're going to get that. So if you're worrying about getting something, if someone, if you have a pattern of, of, of learning issues or alcoholism or issues in your family that seems to keep repeating itself, just the mere fear of thinking, oh my gosh, it's in our family. Am I going to get it? And that, that fear genera is a thinking, feeling, choosing pattern that goes into your brain, goes to those toxic thoughts that have come through that, that um, the DNA and the, the sperm and the ovum into the DNA inside of you and wakes them up. And now you've got this potential to become like that. But you can change this at any time. You'll see throughout this because of neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain this, the brain to be rewired through your mind, we can change those. So if you've done that, never fear, never have guilt and condemnation. Just rejoice that you're hearing this message and that you're reading these books and that you're doing these things and that you're going to do the switch app because it's going to help you to change these situations in your life. So epigenetics deals with these signals, this thinking, feeling, and choosing that generates this action through the brain and that then causes the genes to switch on. The other part of epigenetics is what you're eating, which causes chemical, um, what you eat, what you put in the body, medication, all um, those are, are biological epigenetic factors. The main epigenetic factor, however, is the psychological, this thinking, feeling, and choosing. And as we're thinking, feeling, and choosing, we are in life. So we are experiencing nurturing, which is as we're growing up, and it could be good and bad, good or bad. So maybe bullying, adverse child experiences, etc., um, being in a poverty environment, being in a 
politically uh, in a war zone, in, in a political challenging circuit, all those are our environment becomes an epigenetic factor, epi over and above the gene. So these are all real experiences that we process through our thinking, feeling, and choosing through this funnel of our, our mind. And then that gets planted into our brain and affects how the brain is functioning, how the body is functioning. So when I talk throughout this whole book, the science of epigenetics applies to everything because epigenetics is the study of the signals that are the signals that then activate the genes. And what are those signals? Are thinking, feeling, choosing in response to the circumstances of life and what we put into our bodies and into and onto our bodies. Those are all external factors that then influence how we function. So we need to control what we're eating, what we're thinking, what we're putting on our bodies, how we react to circumstances, the environments that we're in that all play a role. So that's why mental health needs to, mental health research, which is what I'm doing, needs to move in the direction of pouring millions and millions of dollars, not into trying to find more drugs to try and tell people that they're broken and they need drug to fix it, but pouring more and more dollars into setting up community environmental centers where we can go and we can talk and communicate and talk through our problems and learn how to help each other with these techniques that we can, and also we need money to change society. We need to eradicate poverty we need to help people that are hungry we need to give people jobs we need to give people meaningful jobs we need to come together as a community so we can't just take the political easy route out of oh gosh they just sick with pills deal with the symptoms we this is this approach that i'm talking about where you use your mind is that we've got to look at why are people in poverty stricken situations battling so much mentally and physically well they're hungry they're starving, they're concerned, they're worried, they're living in terrible situations, they can't fend for themselves, they're, they're threatened. So politically, we need to we need to not just give them tablets and push them away, we need to change circumstances, create jobs, create ways of put millions into community centers and jobs and food, etc., etc. So their priorities are very skewed. When someone's playing up behaviorally or battling with mental health, we, told them, we tell them they have a disease and give them a drug. That's not solving the problem. That's a nice political cop-out. What we need to do is address the situation. Why are they feeling like that? Why is their job mean? Why 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 did they is the job meaningless? Why is the why are they starving? What is going on in that? What can we do to change the, the, the financial situation of that family and so on? So we have to look bigger societally. We have to look community. And that's what I talk about as well. Okay. So um, I talk about so epigenetics, we can change, we control. Um, there's tremendous amount here about the power to of changing. So in this chapter, I spoke about, um, I speak about this concept of epigenetics. I'm just going to read a few points from the summary from page 68 and 69. Um, chapter three summary. Our thoughts, imagine, and their imagination and choices can change the structure of our brain. Epigenetics is referred to as a fairly new science, but actually it's an ancient science that we find throughout the Bible and throughout all religious texts. At its most basic level, epigenetics is the fact that your thoughts and choices impact your physical brain and body, your mental health and your spiritual development. So these choices don't only affect you, but affect the world. You have an impact on the world. Every thought that you think, feel, and choose and build, it lives for eternity. So either it lives for eternity as a healthy thought or a toxic thought, or you reconceptualize the toxic into a healthy thought. Either way, it's going to live for eternity. So we want to turn it into a positive thought. So the land, uh, then we, uh, the, there's some interesting research that was showed on the agouti mice that showed that when you nurture um, an animal, a, a, a little mice pup, they will, um, it activates the resilience in them and they're much happier. And so the, the kind of environmental impact of the epigenetics is also looks at the environmental impact of nurturing. So and, and so the more you love someone, the more you pull that love signal into someone, the healthier their brain is and the healthier they can cope with life. But if you don't give people enough love and they're too individualized and isolated, then they can get very sick and lonely. And also we see the mice research, um, they, they were big fat yellow mice and they and they this kept happening generations. And what they did was they changed their diet, they changed the an epigenetic factor, they changed part of their diet, and then the pups the next little, uh, the mice pups were born thin and healthy and not yellow anymore. So by changing diet, it changed the outcome of obesity. So there's a lot of research around what we think, what we put into our bodies affects future generations. So that was that chapter. Quickly, the last chapter, chapter four, catch those thoughts. 
I talk in this chapter about how we can bring thought into captivity, how we are designed to capture those thoughts. Those thoughts are not just floating out there. You are designed to say, hey, I'm thinking like this. Because I've used my multiple perspective advantage that we spoke about, I stood back and observed my own thinking. I can stand back, observe my own thinking. And when I do that, I can see, hey, I'm thinking in a really negative way. Or, hey, I'm being very irritable and snappy. Or, hey, I'm really worrying this thing to death. Or, hey, I'm really not responding, whatever it may be. You can stand back, observe it, and then you can start changing it. But we've got to catch those thoughts. We desire to catch those thoughts. We desire to bring all thoughts into captivity, not drug all thoughts into captivity. Psychotropic drugs like antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds and antipsychotics, they drug and numb thoughts into captivity. So the ability to quiet your mind and focus your attention on the present issue, capture your thoughts and dismiss distractions that come your way is an, is an excellent and powerful ability that is inside of you. When you objectively observe your own thinking with the view to capturing those rogue thoughts, you in effect are directing your attention to stop the negative impact and rewire healthy new thoughts. And you can do this. You're designed to capture those thoughts. It's so natural. This is part of your design. It's a way, and, I, and I'm just going to flip through the headings on page 72. You free yourself from burdens. Getting your thoughts disciplined <clears throat> excuse me, and under control is one of the first steps in freeing yourself from the burdens of the world and beginning to enjoy life and rejoicing despite the circumstances. doesn't mean that you're going to pretend they don't exist and just like use scriptures like a magic potion or just a positive affirmation like a magic potion and deny they exist. Bad things happen. We've got to process them. We've got to deal with them. But there's a sense of peace when you approach things from the way that I'm trying to help you understand. When you capture those thoughts, you manage that stress, you get those chaotic thoughts under control. Science shows there's so much benefit in capturing your in catching your thoughts. This research I'm currently doing, if you want to know more about my research, go to drleafresearch.com. And when you do that, you'll see that they explain what we're doing. We've got this first clinical trial running in July, starts in July. Amazing research and to, to bring um, affordable and accessible mental health help. All these things I'm teaching into uh, into apps to help you to help um, help you to help yourself with your mental health and i really need help because clinical trials are so expensive so please go and have a look there and see if you can make a donation anything will help i'm doing whatever i can to help you these book clubs i'm giving you as much as i can and i need your help to be able to help you more so just go and go and read up drleafresearch.com go look at the amazing stuff that we're doing follow the research and whatever you can donate is going to help every single cent goes towards the research so that i can improve what i do and help you even more so i'm doing science to help you to and the benefits of switching on your brain on capturing those thoughts i'm constantly looking at new ways of doing this and new ways to help you so please help me help you so go to that research link and Help me and do, give me a donation if you possibly can. Well, not me. It's the donation for the research to help me to do this. So science shows the benefits of catching your thoughts. Page 73, when you make a conscious decision to focus and direct your attention correctly, you change physical matter. And I've said that repeatedly. So we see that when we see from, from brain technology that when you are focusing on changing your thinking, changes are happening inside of your brain. Changes happen in your blood chemistry. So the benefits are even greater than we imagined. So um, we, we've seen constantly, you know, this book I wrote in 2013, and I've written three books since then, and I'm busy with a fourth book now, and the app that I've just released, the Switch app that I keep talking about, and the research I'm doing, all of these, it's more and more new research that has come out since I wrote this book. But the basic principles are that as you think and feel and choose, you can change your brain, and the benefits of controlling your reactions improves your mental health and your physical health and cope, helps you cope when you're dealing with that cancer. Maybe that cancer is not going away, but you can control your mind so that you can cope and get the resilience to deal with that situation. So you don't go into guilt and condemnation and, and all those terrible things that make things so much worse. So um, we've got a talk about uh, uh, page 75, I'm just jumping jumping around a little bit here. It only takes 5 to 16 minutes a day. This is the most fantastic thing. All this information that I give, which is so much, I know it's so much, that's why I'm creating these apps for you, that I've shown from the research and many of my colleagues and scientists have shown that just training yourself, spending between, six, between 5 and 16 minutes a day 
You can train your mind to do all these things that I'm telling you to do. And that's why you need to get the Switch app because I've really put all these things together to help you to really make this part of your life. You need to read the book. You need to study these things because in reading and studying and doing these book clubs, you are learning new information, which means you're growing your brain, which means you're increasing your intelligence. You need to do this. And you also, to put this into daily practice, you've got to practice things over and over and over and over. That's where the Switch app comes in to help you to practice putting these things into practice. So you could take an hour a day to study these things. You could take 10 minutes a day to read and study this for your Bible study because it's got all the scriptures. And then you can do the Switch app on your phone to help you to then put this into practice. And all of that, the, the, the Bible study and the Switch app is around 7 to 16 minutes. And it's going to revolutionize your life. And you can take an hour in the day, which you should anyway, to study this stuff, to build your brain. And those are two guaranteed things to improve the way that you function as a human. Just absolutely amazingly. Okay. So, I mean, there's so much more. I've just skimmed through. I've tried to encourage you and help you. I hope it's helped you a lot. I hope you're going to dive in, get the materials, get the book, the DVD, the online, the um, the book, the DVD, the, 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 the book, the workbook. The DVD, the Bible, the daily readings or the devotional, and don't forget to get the Switch app, which will end with up and running. The um, the Apple version iOS will be ready by Wednesday, hopefully up and running. And we are just have constantly got add-ons coming onto that. Don't forget to look at our research, drleaf.com. To help me help you, really. The research, we're going to give you all the results for free. I'm giving you as much as I can for free, but I need help to be able to do the research so I can give it as much as I can to you for free and keep all these costs so low. All these prices, I mean, if you go for therapy, you are paying anything from 150 to 500 an hour, sometimes six, 700 an hour if you go to a psychiatrist and they're giving you medication. Here, I'm teaching you through minimal cost how to activate and use your mind. That's why I do these YouTube lives. That's why I'm doing this to help you. So help me help you. Okay, so I have to do one more thing. This is a long session today, but I also have to finish last week. We didn't quite finish the last chapter of this book, and I don't want to leave you hanging. Um, so we were studying this for the last for the last um, few weeks, Think and Eat Yourself Smart. Also has a workbook. We've just done the DVD. It's going to be released very soon. And some other exciting news is all my DVDs are going to be available online as a link as well very soon. As, so we're going to be able to tell you about that soon. So I was dealing with this book, Think and Eat Yourself Smart. And it was the last chapter where we were dealing with Beat It, which were the 12 tips to help you apply all the principles of eating, thinking and eating yourself smart. And we got as far as, chapter, as tip six. So tip number seven is about buying food. And in in tip number seven, which is on page 224, if you've got your books, if you haven't, you can go pick up this book at, um, online as well and the DVD and everything. Um, but if you, those of you that have been following me, we went up to tip six. So tip seven, I talk about buying food. And you, you need to be really mentally prepared. If you're starving and you go buying food, the chances of you buying the wrong foods are very, very strong because the supermarket is designed to take advantage of that. And so all the bad foods tend to be at eye level and at the front where it's easy to grab something and snack on it while you're shopping or snack on it in the car. And that's never a good idea. It's never a good idea to eat on the run, snack on the run. Be very, very um, mindful about your eating. Remember one of the main rules, the, the rule of thinking and eating yourself smart is think and eat yourself smart. Eat real food mindfully. This ties totally into switch on your brain that we're talking about today. Your mind is building the stuff into your brain and that's what you do so if you're not mindful about your eating and you're just reactive you're just going to eat badly and that's epigenetically going to damage your brain and your body so when purchasing any food items make sure it's real food okay insofar as possible not a food like product not the modern american diet which is so bad for you which messes up the gut brain connection and everything i've been telling you try to shop outside the supermarket visit your local consumer supported agriculture farmers markets, farmstead stores, start growing or raising your own food. There's so much advice and help on that. You could have a raised bed in your garden. You could have hoops on your window or whatever. There's so many ways of doing it and so many sites. I give you so many links in here to help you to do that. Get to know the people who produce your food. Find out farms and let them, you know, find the farms and let them send you food and, you know, order from there. It's a very, take it as a very exciting, challenging, um, enjoyable thing to buy food. Okay, 
Um, if you eat out, support establishments that serve that that serve local farm to table and organically produced foods as much as possible. I always do that. We, wherever we are in the world, we will only go to restaurants that are organic, farm to table, and support local farmers because we vote with our fork. We are going to support the farmers that are producing the food that is good for us, that is part of our wide for love. That is really switching on your brain. This, these two together work so well together. You need to get all these books. Okay, so if you are, um, buy wild foods as much as possible. These are generally more nutritious and make meal uh, a meal both much more exciting and impressive. This, this tip applies to all food types. Try and get as wild as possible. But this means that they have more nutrients. You're going to get more you know, wild, grass-fed, pasture-raised. These are the things we, the food that is going to give you what your brain and body need so that you can that you can switch on your brain and you can function, think, and eat yourself smart. Okay, tip number eight, respect your environment. Your environment grows your food. So if you're not respecting your environment by supporting the modern American diet, or which is using all kinds of ways of damaging the earth and damaging and hurting animals and damaging the environment and causing all kinds of problems which results in climate change and all kinds of stuff. If you are a steward of creation, you need to respect your environment. So whatever you, I just want to read this one scripture from Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So you've got to ask yourself, if, the, if you're eating food that's destroying the earth or hurting animals, and hurting your body, is that respectful? You know, is that respecting the environment? Is that worshiping God? So before you purchase any food, think deeply about how that food was produced. If I'm on page 226. If you purchase it, ask yourself whether you are stewarding God's creation. That's like a challenging question, but get into that. Okay, how to cook, tip number nine. So often diet books are so concerned with what to eat and what not to eat. And I'm not, this is not a diet book. This is a book that says eat real food mindfully. It teaches you about the dangers of the environment, the impact of the modern American diet on the, the earth and you, and how 12 tips to put this all into place to actually put, bring these principles into your life. So you can eat whatever diet you want. You can do keto, you can, which is what we're doing at the moment. You can do paleo. You can do it as long as it's real food and it's done mindfully. Okay, And mindfully is how you approach the food, sitting down and eating, not doing it in a rush, all these things we're talking about. So often diet books are so concerned about just you know, telling you what you can't eat that they don't tell you how to cook. And if you, sometimes you can cook in a way that destroys the food. So, for example, in point tip number one, some vegetables are better eaten raw, such as lettuce, greens. Other vegetables are better eaten cooked, such as carrots and tomatoes. So for, for a full list, list of fruits and vegetable preparation, there's a great site that I refer you to in this book on page 227. Um Eat your, like eat your produce, point number two, eat your produce with a type of fat in order to absorb the fat-soluble nutrients. So, like, for example, if you're eating um, fruits, it's a very good idea to eat your fruits with a fat, so maybe a bit of cheese or some cream, because the fats will then um, take, will, uh, because some nutrients in the fruit can only dissolve in fat. So the fat-soluble nutrients need fat to be absorbed. So you're going to lose some nutrients if you don't eat your produce with fats. I mean, there's some great tips here. Um, for meat, I'd suggest things like steaming and a sous vide method and cooking soups and stews and broths on low heat if you're grilling, grilling very quickly. Um, so acids such as vinegar and lemon juice reduce the, the, the risk of unwanted uh, cooking side effects. So use them for cooking all types of food. So there's some fantastic tips on how to cook your food. Tip number 10, how to eat you know, fast-paced, busy, modern lifestyle I'm too busy to sit down and eat a home-cooked meal. So you're on the run, shoving it down while you're driving, or in front of the computer working, or at the table and you're eating before you've even sat down. Prepare your food. Make it look beautiful. Prepare your mind. Put the music on. Make it a whole conversation. Yesterday, the whole family got me at the family here. We all got together and decided what to eat. And we're talking and preparing the food and laying the table and sat down and enjoyed the preparation, made it look beautiful, ate it slowly, savored it. In that way, we ate real food mindfully. And we got everything that our body required. Let your mind, not your eyes, be your guide. It's not a good idea to decide visually how much to eat, since you will have a tendency to finish what's on the plate rather than stopping in full. Put less food on your plate. Use a smaller plate. Eat less from a box and less in front of a box, the TV. 
enjoy preparing the meal. Use the hurry hachi boo boo, hurry hachi boo principle. This is an Okinawan saying where uh, to stop eating when you're 80% full. So you should eat when you're 80% full. So you feel like you've still got some room, that you could still eat something. That's when you should stop. So you should stop when you've still got room. Not stop when you think, oh my gosh, I can't even move from the table and you're in a food coma. That's not good. Then you've done hurry hachi boo boo. You want to eat hurry hachi boo for 80% full. Tip number 11. Sleep schedules and direct digestion. So the brain and the gut are connected with many things. Sleeping is very affected to your eating. How you eat, how you digest food is definitely affected, will affect your eating. So there's, we, we need to remember, don't, work, uh, um, don't worry when you go to sleep because that's going to keep you awake. If you've just eaten a heavy meal and you're overeaten, it's going to affect your digestion, which is going to affect your sleep. So that tips about how do you put those into place? Exercise, you have to exercise. We all know that. It's so logical. But eat less, move more. We've all heard that saying at some point in our lives. Not only does exercise make our blood circulate more efficiently through our bodies, bringing chemicals of life to the cells and removing debris of, debris of, meta of metabolism, but it can also improve all areas of cognitive function. So when you exercise, you're taking toxic debris out your brain. You've got the vacuum cleaner, and it's sucking out all the dirt out of your brain. And if that stays there, it clogs up brain cells, which means when your mind moves through your brain and you're trying to switch on your brain and do all these things and detox and, and all that stuff, it gets affected by this clogged up mess of the modern American diet in your brain that you didn't that you didn't digest properly or that bad food that you haven't eaten correctly. So when we exercise, we are facilitating the debris, removing the debris. And as you are eating food, your body goes through all this metabolism and metabolism has side effects. And those toxic side effects need to be removed and they're removed in your blood and exercise helps them to be removed quicker. Okay, so that's all for today. It was a long session. Well done for concentrating for so long. You are brilliant. The more you challenge your mind, the more brilliant you become. Join me next week. Next week, we'll be doing the next few chapters. You'll see that posted on social media. Don't forget to follow me on social media. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Don't forget to listen to the podcast. Remember, every week I bring out a podcast with great tips on mental health. All these principles being incorporated in very, very specific things like how to deal with a panic attack and how to deal with, with um, Monday blues or whatever. And then the blog matches what? I say that week. So subscribe to our email list, subscribe to our YouTube channel and put all this into your daily life. You can listen in the car, whatever. And all these are going to boost your mental health and make you an amazing human. Thanks for joining me this week. See you next week, same time. Bye everyone.